Welcome. How are you guys doing? Great. Yeah, very good. All right. Thrilled to be here. So we're here to talk about drones, specifically Jeez. one drone company and an investor in said drone company. Um, so Blake, Aaron, why don't you, Blake, why don't you tell us about your company that you started? And uh, Aaron, you can tell us about what, you know, what caught your eye. Yeah, sounds good. You cool. go first. <laughs> yeah, no, happy, happy to do that. So uh, we're, we're Brink. We're basically a public safety drone company. So um, my deal, I uh, started my engineering career over at McLaren Automotive when I was 14. So I, I think their youngest ever engineering intern. Um, then went to Tesla Motors, briefly met Elon, so sort of life goal fulfilled <laughs> that one. Uh, and then worked over at DJI, so world's largest drone company by, by far. Um, done some cool personal projects too. I built uh, an inertial electrostatic confinement nuclear fusion reactor in my garage. Wow. Completely terrified my neighbors, but I, I had a good time. But it didn't it. blow up. Has like a did not, did not blow up. Didn't yeah. blow down. <laughs> we'll see how badly irradiated I am at like 40, but um, still alive for now. And uh, yeah, I've, I've loved drones my whole life. Uh, always been building something, but uh, then the, the October 1 shooting happened in my hometown. So uh, I, I grew up in Las Vegas. I knew some folks that um, were were on the strip, you know, at the Route 91 Harvest Festival when uh, when that when that started, and that's what vectored me in the direction of public safety. Just kind of this thought that maybe there's a place for modern technology in the hands of first responders when dealing with active shooter events. And uh, yeah, that that turned into me basically looking up the phone number of Las Vegas SWAT team and cold calling them. Um, I I met with them, built basically what I thought they wanted. They hated it, told me so, completely re-engineered it, uh, went on call with them for a while, and uh, yeah, that basically turned into our, our first product, which was the lemur drum. So in a nutshell, that's sort of the story so far. Okay, Aaron, and what, what of all that stood out to you that you're like, all right, Index Ventures has to invest? Yeah, well, I mean, going back a little ways, so before I was uh, a partner at Index, I spent the bulk of my career at a, at a company called Palantir, which builds software for um, lots of large industries, DOD, police departments, as well as lots of large companies like BP and Airbus. And so I always really gravitated towards those kind of hard problems where you know it's actually quite complex. There are lots of different stakeholders. It's not. It's a, a bit of a gray area. There's not like an obvious you know every time right or wrong answer. Right, not, not just another SaaS tool, right? Not just another SaaS company. Um, and, and then when I joined Index, I spent most of my time on companies that were more on the software side, so more data, more AI, ML. But Index, one of the reasons I joined the firm is we had been doing sort of investing in this general category of deeper tech for a while. So we were invested in companies like Aurora, self-driving cars in their Series A very early, Covariant, which is an AI-powered robotics company. Um, and I really liked that kind of like hardware meets software, like solving really challenging yep. problems that other investors might not be kind of so drawn of to. But originally how we met Blake, actually, so we're in, we were early investors in Scale AI, and one of our best sourcing mechanisms is asking our top founders, like, who are you meeting? Like, what are you angel investing in? Or like, you know, who did you meet at a party recently that you think is just killing it? And Alex Wang, the CEO of Scale, was like, well, Sam Altman and I recently led the seed round in this company. He's like this crazy, mad scientist, but he's like really, really smart, and he's building this product. And we were like getting more and more excited. And then he was like, oh, but it, it's drones for the police. And we were like, oh, interesting. Like, that's not a market that Index has ever thought about, that we've really ever invested in. And we were like, oh, this is, okay, we'll give it a, sh we'll give it a shot. And uh, we, a few of us met Blake uh, for the first time, and all of us were like, wow. You know, he was, he was 20 at the time. You know, he was building in his garage, essentially. But the amount of time he had spent with customers, like really understanding the problem, and his ability to go super specific into the technical details, but then also zoom out and talk about the really big picture, both in terms of the business and the societal effects, like that's quite rare to see. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we did the work and talked to customers and spent a lot of time understanding the market. Um, and then by the time kind of he presented to our partnership, it was like the most unanimous investment decision we had ever made, despite the fact that, you know, we were pretty new to the market in the space. And what, sorry, what was the investment thesis for a drone? Was it a, just a drone company or specifically a drone safety company? Yeah, there, we were kind of, our investment thesis was based on a few kind of larger market trends. Like deep First, tech in general? 
yes, deep tech to start, but also kind of a realization that there was pretty large swings towards U.S. manufacturing, right. both because of the realization coming out of COVID that our supply chains were way too dependent on China, and also a much a political climate that was changing where people were much more worried about IP risk and overall national security risk of using oh, and having, having an over-reliance on Chinese technology. There was also a realization, you know, it was coming out of a lot of the shootings and uh, police uh, uh, protest, protest against the police across America. So we had an idea that there was going to be a massive investment across the U.S. in, you know, in uh, in uh, technology and products that helped de-escalate conflicts and reduce the risk of violence, um, and just a general realization that deep tech was going to be part of the fabric of how our society operated. So a lot more autonomy, a lot more tools for people to be able to navigate situations that are dangerous, that are complex. Um, and so all those things sort of coming together uh, gave us a lot of confidence in investing in Brink. Awesome. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, so you mentioned the Lemur. I understand that earlier this year you released, launched the Lemur 2. I don't, it's not in production yet, right? But you're shopping it around. Very close. Very uh, close. I think we have a video for it. Maybe they'll, they'll put it up. Yeah, let's do it. Um, see if we can get them to hit play. Cool. Yeah, happy, happy to talk a little bit more about what, what we build. Um, fundamentally, it's a tool to get eyes and ears in dangerous places. So instead of sending a dozen people, you know, holding assault, assault weapons basically into a SWAT call-out scenario to physically arrest someone, which is, you know, incredibly dangerous for everyone because yep. it risks a gunfight, uh, send in a small drone. So uh, we build the first drone in the world capable of taking off, you know, flying a block up to a structure, looking around the outside, but then finding a window, breaking out that window with a glass breaker attachment, flying indoors, uh, utilizing technologies like LIDAR, uh, in fact, multiple LIDAR sensors on board the aircraft, uh, and also camera systems that utilize AI and ML in order to sort of navigate and localize through the world. Uh, to, you know, fly around, clear rooms, push open interior doors. If they ever land on its back, if it ever lands on its back, it can flip itself over, take back off, continue a mission. Uh, and then when it does find someone, it's the first drone in the world that has a two-way audio system. So you can put on a hostage negotiator, put on a crisis negotiator, utilize the drone like a flying cell phone, uh, and de-escalate that scenario, kind of all with the goal of creating distance between first responders and suspects uh, and, and de-escalating these types of situations um, to avoid the, the use of force. Oh, so, so is that, is that autonom fully autonomous? Is it semi-autonomous? Is someone controlling the drone for some of the actions? Yeah, that's true. So it, it is a semi-autonomous system. Um, so it's utilizing a couple of LIDARs and a couple of cameras in order to basically map the world. From there, it's able to figure out where it is and hold its position without pilot input. So it basically knows its relative velocity versus walls and then can apply corrective input to stay in that position. So you can just take your hands off the sticks. The drone will just hold its position for any amount of time. That's actually pretty hard to do without GPS. And that is how the majority of drones on the market mm. sort of solve this problem. But the second you fly under a roof, you lose GPS, not an option right. in, in our use case. Um, that map is also used for obstacle avoidance functions. So it will basically prevent you from crashing into a wall, you know, crashing into drapes or something similar. Um, and then we take the output of all of these systems and we actually send that to users as a 3D map, which they can then take 2D slices of to generate 2D floor plans. So as our drone is flying around, it's actually drawing a floor plan of the structure uh, that it's clearing, which is which, like wildly helpful for first response. Yeah, I, I learned a fun fact recently when they had their big launch party, which is that the majority of police departments, when they need to enter a building, they don't really have a source of floor plans. What they use is Zillow. <laughs> no. So yeah, the oh, majority geez. of police departments. So to be able to have this kind of data asset that uh, that lives much longer, even after kind of a particular mission, is what is, is pretty you know special. It's, it's fairly yeah. recent, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, all of this stuff just became possible. Like, the sensors that we're utilizing in this aircraft 
came onto the market you know, a couple of months ago. Um, and compute has obviously also kind of uh, evolved in, in lockstep with that, yeah. where we're able to embed enough processing power on board these aircraft now that we can deal with that you know, torrent of information that all these sensors are collecting, uh, and then utilize it to make actionable decisions on uh, you know, navigation around a structure, for example. Um, so we found great use cases in, in police, but what we've also kind of found along the way is there are also incredible use cases in hazmat response, you know, using one of these things to carry a chemical detector or a Geiger counter, uh, and also in collapsed building response. So um, we've had some amazing successes in the past uh, responding to the Surfside building collapse in Florida. Uh, Ukraine is actually our largest operator right now with 60 systems. Um, it's not their Ministry of Defense, it's actually their FEMA equivalent. So they're like state emergency services. Uh, they're using our drones to look for survivors in buildings that might have been hit by a cruise missile or artillery. Uh, and then just a couple of months ago, we've done a lot of work in Turkey responding to the earthquake in the region. So there, there are unfortunately many buildings there that may be partially collapsed. Um, entrances are obstructed, stairways internally are, are collapsed. It's very hard for first responders to search you know, maybe the 11th story of this building. And uh, that's a capability that our technology provides. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about your philosophy for going back to autonomy? I'm curious, is, is the plan to just keep stick with semi-autonomous or you only use autonomy for anything that makes the drone function but not so much like keep all the decision making to the human or are you gonna have different products dependent on the use case? So one thing that's interesting about SWAT callouts in particular is Usually, first responders have quite a lot of useful information. Like, they might have a pretty good feeling that a suspect is in this corner of the house, for example. Um, and it's, it's really useful for them to be able to take off the drone and just fly to that corner of the structure. Or there are other scenarios where they're worried about a particular door opening up and then someone, you know, coming out due to some other actions that they might be taking. So there's, there's this kind of component of these missions where being able to have a human in the loop to make those calls that take in the full context of the environment uh, is, is actually radically helpful. And I don't think that's going to change any time in the next couple of decades. Um, I think people are always basically going to be deciding where the drone should go next uh, during a SWAT call out. So we think autonomy systems are amazing, but we view them mostly as a pilot assistance tool to make our drone as easy to fly as possible and increase the probability of mission success, more so than a tool that we're going to utilize to make you know, higher level strategic decisions. Okay. Aaron, you meant, oh sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You mentioned China earlier and the you know, Chinese US tensions around drones and uh, you know, where drones are being manufactured, is that, Blake, are you seeing that as an opportunity or, uh, you know, to capture market share? Is that something that you're, you're looking into? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating moment in time because the largest drone companies in the world are really all based out of one city, which is Shenzhen. Yeah. Um, like just DJI and Autel combined control 95% of the market. They, they really own the entire thing. So... The U.S. government, at the same time, has banned itself from purchasing Chinese drones. And they are the biggest drone buyer in the world. So there's this, this fascinating moment where the biggest drone companies in the world cannot sell into the biggest drone buyers in the world. And uh, there's an immense need for a drone maker for the free world. And that, um, that's kind of what we eventually want to be. And I think that offers a lot of really interesting opportunities for, you know, when we, when we talk about autonomy, it's not just about, oh, the robot flies itself. But when we think about autonomy and how Brink is thinking about building their company, and also when you look at, you know, our other portfolio companies in this space, um, it extends sort of end, the end-to-end -end life cycle of the product. So, you know, how do you manufacture a competitive drone product in the U.S. when you're competing with a Chinese drone company that's, you know, manufacturing uh, you know, m millions and millions in a year, it's really hard to do that if you don't have like highly autonomous manufacturing processes. And what we're, we're excited to see is an emergence of kind of an autonomous 
factory notion in the United States for the first time in a really long time, uh, which is going to hopefully open up a lot more high-tech manufacturing in the United States at comparable cost uh, with what you might get uh, what you might get in China. And then on the very other end of the spectrum, um, you know, autonomy isn't just an, an, an AI system. This isn't just how you fly the drone. I think the point you made er earlier when we were chatting about translation is really interesting. Like you could have yeah. pieces of autonomy built all, all throughout how your product is used, like the, to, the ability to be able to do live translation with a, a suspect negotiation situation. 100%. Given, given the context that, you know, all these drones are being used in, I'm curious how, like it's, these are very high risk areas, right? How do you think about mitigating risks and is it purely a technological problem, like let's use, just throw technology at it and mitigate risk, or are there other things that you're building within your company or within partnerships that you have to factor in as you continue to grow your, your clientele, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a fairly complicated question. Um, I think the, the baseline is that the technology is very reliable. You know, every time you take the drone off, the localization systems will work, you know, the obstacle avoidance systems will work, even if you're in a GPS night environment, even if the lights are off, even if you're kicking up an enormous amount of dust from the ground or insulation in an attic or anything like that. Um, that, that is definitely the, you know, the baseline that, that has to be achieved. What's, what's your failure rate for like the drone just falling and just collect, like no longer flying, hitting the ground? It depends a lot on external conditions, right? right. So like in, Flying around here would be pretty easy, right? Because we, we have some lighting, no you know, it's a large open area, so if we start getting a little bit of slip, it's no big deal, our systems will recognize that. But you start, so one environment that would be really nasty for us would be, I don't know, uh, I a mean jungle. somewhere, like <laughs> honestly a lot of our collapsed building work, right? Where the opening that our drone has to fit through in order to clear a room might be this big, you know, our drone is this big. That's already a problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you're dealing with an enormous amount of material, most likely, uh, to, get, to get your signal back from the aircraft. This is another thing. We're transmitting live video, and we also need command and control signals. So it's important that you have two-way data comms between your handheld controller and the aircraft. So, you know, that would present some challenges. The lights would be off in a collapsed building, especially if you're operating at night or just in, you know, in a building that's that had collapsed badly. Um, and of course, you know, your GPS denied because there's a bunch of concrete above you. So, and just to add <laughs> even more fun to this, uh, you're kicking up enough dust and enough debris that you might be getting incorrect LIDAR readings, phantom readings from dust particles, uh, you know, that, that aren't actually reflective of your, your environment. Um, so, you know, in that condition, Honestly, we, th we build the most reliable drone in the world, but uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect every time. So, yeah, that's kind of how we think about it. Yeah, I think it's really about how do you build that trust with the user. Um, and in this case, the user is kind of multiple different, there's multiple different stakeholders. And it's a hardware problem, it's a software problem, it's how do you communicate with people, it's how do you make sure that they understand what it is they're getting. Um, and it's, it, it, I think that that trust, that um, that issue of building and keeping the trust of your customers is something yeah. that every single person at Brink takes really seriously, uh, and um, it's great to see. Yeah, and we know, you know, we know these technologies save lives when, um, you know, when they're used in the right conditions. So, um, yeah, we work we work really hard to make sure that they can be used as as, as much as possible. Well, thank you. I mean, that's a lot, a lot to juggle to, for, you know, to create drones that actually make a difference. Please join me in thanking Aaron and Blake.